So that, remember that, that just records the camera. Um, oh, okay. You know what I mean? So we have footage for that. Yeah. How many your first time at your first See you later. Well, thanks for coming. My name is Chris Haddon, I'm part of the Bankers. Jason Dale and I all have this meetup group. We'll talk as loud as you can. Okay. It's the new version of the old school three of my life. It's been working out very well, so I hope you enjoy it. It's going live. Yeah, we'll take a I understand. Good thing. And that is what tonight's presentation is about. So with that, please put your hands together for Ian Walsh from TCS. All right. Thanks, Chris. People usually don't clap for me when I come on stage, so thank you. Boo? I get booed? Somebody boo me? Are you an Eagles fan? Is that what we got back there? No? Okay. So guys, so um, as I was just talking to Jason, after this, so I'm going to talk for maybe 30, 45 minutes. Then there'll be some Q&A. There's some other pretty large investors in this room that will also be able to answer some questions. So maybe 30, 45 minutes, ask uh, questions after. If you really have an urgent question that has to be asked now, go ahead. But um, I'll talk and then we'll go from there. So good, Jay? Good, okay. So um, you guys don't know me. I'm in the Philadelphia market. Maybe you do know me. I'm, uh, I lend with hard money bankers. I'm a, a partner in the Philadelphia area, South Jersey. Uh, I do a good bit of these presentations, typically on hard money. So why am I here talking about property management? They didn't just find a guy in the office that was going to talk about property management to fill space. I have a pretty good bit of experience at what I do. So my background is I got in the business in roughly 2008 and when the world was ending, I jumped in and I ended up wholesaling. There's some big wholesalers in this room. Terry, where's Terry? No, Terry's a big wholesaler. Uh, locally, so I used to wholesale a lot of properties. We do maybe 100, 150 deals a year, and that's how I got my feet wet. That then steamrolled into a property management business. Probably not by choice, quite frankly. I was young, I was fresh out of school, and at that time, um, it made sense for cash flow. It seemed to be okay. Didn't know any better. It's, as we call it, the redheaded stepchild of the real estate industry, the least sexiest part of what we do, right? So. But I got in and I got after it. And we ended up building a management company called Atlas Property Management, built it up to six, 700 units in the Philadelphia area, ended up selling it to uh, my current partners at TCS Management. And um, they were bought out by a much larger, op we were bought out by much larger operations. And I retained some partnership with them and we have about 2,000 units under management in the Philadelphia market, Maryland, South Jersey, and so forth. So, um, that's my background. I'm not coming to you, talking to you about not knowing this. What I've seen over the years, I saw people get wiped out in the market. I saw people succeed to make millions in the market. We had a lot of third party investors. So I have a really good um, scope of what it takes to make it in this business and what you should and shouldn't do. And that's what I'll talk to you guys about tonight. So I wanna start off, actually Terry, Terry in our office, thank you Terry. Where's our Terry? Terry, there she is, Terry. Terry is actually the heart and soul of what we do internally, so thank you, Terry, for also bringing these shirts to me tonight. And the reason I have these shirts here is because, so who here owns property? Stand up. You own property? Stand up. We're gonna do the, wow. <laughs> this room, no, stay up, stay standing. 
Usually these rooms are not filled with people that own property. Okay, so the next question, we're gonna do this like a wedding. So you know when you're like, hey, I've been married for one year, sit down, I've been married for two years. Okay, if you have five properties, sit down. Five properties or less, sit down. You have five and a half, what do you got? Uh, if you have 10 properties or less, sit down. 20 properties or less, sit down. 15 properties or more, stand up. Good, you win. I want to know who I was dealing with tonight. Here you go, HMB shirts. Thank you. Was there a lady in there? You know what, you know what? Terry, who's always prepared from our office, said if a woman stands up, we have a woman's shirt. So, that's yours. And I got three, wait, I got three more shirts. Who's got 10 properties? Raise your hand. Just raise it, there you go. And, all right, this is gonna be long. Somebody's losing a drink. I, I warned you guys, I didn't know what to tell you. Sorry, buddy. All right, that one's on HMB. That one and the next one's on HMB. Sorry about that. I didn't ruin your night, right? No laptop or anything, sorry, buddy. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about you guys wanna know is, you wanna know do I wanna manage my own properties or do I wanna have a property management company? I think ultimately, it's, the question is not, you're not starting with that question. The question you have to know is first, am I buying a good deal? Second, what kind of person am I? And those are two really important questions when you start this because A, if you buy a property incorrectly, you know, what's the old saying in, in real estate investing? Location, true. Who said that? Yep. Do I have an extra shirt? Uh, you already got a shirt. You got two shirts. I can't do it. So you guys have a, uh, you, you have to make money when you buy your property. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you actually cash out the moment you buy a property. Really buying a property at a steep discount is allowing you, especially if you're new, a lot of room for error or to make a lot of money if you know what you're doing. Ultimately though, if you buy it at too high of a number, you're gonna be in a position where things are very tight and, and you're, you're operating behind the eight ball. So the first thing you have to do as an investor is always buy right. Now I don't mean, you know, hey, they're asking 150 for this house, I wanna buy it for 130. That's not a deal, okay? If you're asking 150 for a house and you buy it for like 30 and it's gonna retail, you know, at 250 and you're gonna put 80, 90 in, that's a much better deal. Now you're in a position, you say, okay, I have a deal that's gonna cash flow. And there's a lot of reasons you wanna buy that right. I can go into all this, the, the things that are real. I'm a firm believer in your monthly nut. Here's a good tip, you can write this one down. Everyone here has properties. Your monthly principal and interest should never exceed 50, 45 to 50% of your uh, cash flow. I'm sorry, your rent roll. If that means if your rent is 900 bucks, your rent, uh, I'm sorry, if your rent is 900 bucks, your principal and interest should never exceed $450. That gap in between is your actual cash flow. You have no way I'm making 450 bucks a month. That's not true. Yes, it is. You have evictions, you have turnovers, you have um, gas, you have legal, you have things that are real. That number is true. It stands the test of time. And the guys and girls under me, or not under me, that we've managed over the years that have made millions of dollars hold true to that formula where they did it intentionally or not. The people that got wiped out in 2008, and I dealt with a lot of them. That was one of the reasons we got built so fast. You had a bunch of people came in, over leveraged their properties, and all of a sudden, um, they have 20, 30 properties. They had to go back to work because they, you know, their monthly mortgage was 800 bucks, and they're renting for 850, and they have one eviction, and they wipe out 20 properties worth of, you know, income in three months' time because they have turnovers and so forth, and they're spending. So they're back at work before you know it the banks at their door taking their properties. It, it happens that fast if you're not careful. So 45 to 50% uh, um, principal and interest of your principal and interest should be your rent roll. That's a really good safe number to be at when you're, when you're figuring out how much should I cash flow. So now we've established the fact that you have bought a good deal, great. The real question is how many people in here have a property management company? One, seriously? You guys have no good property managers around here? You have one, okay. How many people, that's all right, I talk fast. That's my downfall for being up here, I apologize. I talk fast, I have bad posture, and I don't smile much. I've been told this before. <laughs> so the next question is, how many people manage their own properties? Let me just see those hands. Wow, okay, a lot of people. So I would venture to say the best question you should ask yourself before you get into this business as a property manager is who am I? And who am I not me, but you? Because if you can't, 
evict somebody, if you can't throw somebody out on the streets, if that is going to wear you down, this isn't for you in managing your own properties. If you are that person, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means you understand the business you're in. I'm in the business. I have 2,000 properties we manage. See a lot of evictions. I don't like evicting. It's like uh, Tony had a really good analogy earlier, which is eviction is like firing somebody. Nobody likes to do it, but nobody really wants to be in that position, right? The employee or whoever it is is not happy with where they are. It's not working out. The boss doesn't really, it's not working out for the boss. It's a toxic relationship. That's what an eviction is. This business is like a velvet hammer, right? It, it doesn't, one deal typically doesn't knock you out, doesn't knock you out cold. It's that little hammer that taps you over the years, over the years and wears you down. It doesn't mean it's going to wear you down because I know a lot, a lot of millionaires that have made a lot, a lot of money managing their own properties and that's okay. But they knew up front or they were built for it. It's not a corporate field. This is, at the end of the day, you have to get your money and you have to do it the most efficient way possible because if you don't do it that way and you don't operate uh, if you operate emotionally, you're going to put yourself in a bad position because you're going to let somebody slide on rent. And where's that money coming from if that money slides on rent? Either your other properties or your pocket. It's the same place, right? You're still forking over money. How often can you do that? How often can you let that velvet hammer hit you in the head and deal with that? And I'm not trying to discourage anyone from being a landlord. It's just I ask you to ask yourself that question up front before you get in this business. If the, if the answer is, I can handle this, I get it, usually you probably had your th skin thickened a little bit. Here, here, somebody had 10 properties or more, I threw somebody a shirt. Who was at 15? Yep. You, you probably have thicker skin than when you started, right? I did collections for 10 years before I bought properties. Oh, so you were building your thick, <laughs> you were building your thick skin before you got into this. Actually, that's a great segue. So that man can say to himself, he can go, I can handle this business. I can take the ugliest part of real estate and I've been doing it for 10 years and I can do it for another 10 if I want, but instead I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do management. But you ultimately knew it by your, it yourself internally, you could handle evictions, you could handle um, you know, repairs, you could handle all these tough questions that come up because you have to get that money. You have to collect the money. If you're not collecting the money and you can't do the repairs for your business, you're not doing your tenants a service, you're not doing your investment portfolio service, nobody wins if you're not making money. The other thing that I'd recommend, highly recommend, is you ask yourself, how consistent am I? Collection guy, perfect. You're gonna be pretty damn consistent, right? You're calling you every night, six o'clock, annoying you. No, not you, okay. So, one text, okay, he's really good. So what I recommend is something that is really um, important to your personality trait if you're self-managing is, is being a consistent individual. What do I mean by that? It means your processes are consistent. It means your, the way you operate your business are consistent. You cannot, it's not fair to your tenant, it's not fair to the people that you work with. If one day you have a bad day and you change all your policies with your tenants and, and you call them up yelling at them and you're mad at them, that's not how this business works because it is a business. So if you establish policies, you know yourself well enough, you have to know yourself, you're gonna do this every single month, the same thing, every single month, you're gonna either adhere to your leases in this way or you're not. When a tenant calls you, I don't wanna say it's training your tenant because it's not that. I love, we have some fantastic relationships with tenants that we deal with now, but what it is is it's allowing them to understand the expectations of how to work with you. And it's so important whether you're a property management company or whether you're a landlord for them to understand what do they expect when you speak with them? If I have a leaky faucet, what's the expectation they have of you? It should be consistent every single time. You'll have a much better relationship. If you're gonna be out there in 24 hours and that's the tone you set, that's the tone you set. But do it every time. When you become volatile in your decision making and not being a consistent person, you're, you're risking. You're risking money is what you're ultimately risking. And then you're making somebody's, somebody else's life because you have real people in these properties. Like, it's weird because it, as much of it is, as it is a business to, to me, I respect the fact that we have families, people in these houses, and we try to, from the, from the TCS management perspective, we try to deliver a very consistent approach, and that's important for the, for the landlord as well, is to deliver that. I'm not always saying, some landlords are tougher, some say fix your own stuff, I got a $50 clause in, in, in my lease, every repair is 50 bucks, whatever it may be. There's no right or wrong answer in that question. The, the, the right or wrong approach is being consistent. So, if you've established a fact, how many people that own their own properties? This is gonna be a tough question. I know not everybody's gonna answer. Don't wanna manage their own properties. How many people is wearing them down? Yeah, perfect, the only two people in our office say me. Somebody, somebody in here says, hey, this is, this is a lot. You know, I, I don't sleep some nights, I get, all right, somebody's lying to me. 
Somebody, somebody, I'm telling you, I've had this conversation too many times in the room full of too many people with properties. They're not in love with this business and they don't know what to do. So in the event that you decide, hey, this wasn't for me, maybe I made a mistake, maybe I thought it was for me, we all make mistakes, believe me, I made plenty. You get into a position where you have to say, hey, this is maybe something I look at a property management company because I can't go for the next 20 years of my life dealing with these conversations and handling the repairs and my contractors and et cetera. You know, I'm trying to scale my business and trying to get out of my job. I can't do it managing the properties. That's a huge thing. Now you get into the realm of hiring a property manager. We are not all built the same. Okay, how many people have had an experience with a, private, a property manager and came back or took their properties back? They're, I'm, I'm sure they're out here. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, Miss, what was your experience with? It, it just didn't work out. Yeah. Didn't work out probably because they weren't giving you the service or didn't give you the expectation of what you anticipated, right? So your relationship with a property manager and deciding if you're going to go to a property management company is just as important as the relation. It's the, it's the property managers and your responsibility to make sure you each have this, the, the proper expectations. So if you expected one thing, I'm not saying it's the case, and they delivered another thing, somebody didn't ex set the proper expectations and they weren't consistent with what they were doing. There's a lot of people in this business or a lot of management companies in this business that get into it. Maybe they're realtors during the day. They think they're going to collect some rent checks at night and manage your property, your most valuable assets, and they're going to do a great job. That's not, that's not how to properly do it. The proper way to do it, and this is not a pitch. I can only speak from where I've come from. This is not a pitch for TCS management. I just know that we are the best management company in the Northeast, period. If, if you want to come up, come up and ask. Everybody's been to our office. And I'm going to tell you why, though. It's not because... I'll tell you why, it's very talented people are in that office. I don't actually have anything to do with this, it's the people. And they run very, very consistently, and here's why. So you have 2,000 properties, probably 30 people on staff, each one of them is a specialist in their department. And you have a residential affairs department dealing with all incoming calls, you have a really good software system that handles all the accounting. You have um, people that handle evictions. You have a leasing department doing 60 leases a month. You have a contracting department. All departments, all businesses effectively inside this business, each individually specializing in what they do. That's what it takes to manage properties correctly. If you don't have departmentalized, a departmentalized approach, if you have like one property manager, here's a big risk. One property, you go to a property manager company and they have five property managers. All that says to me, that's the background of that question, because you're vetting your property manager at this point, because if you've decided to go there, you've got to find the right one, otherwise don't do it. You've got these property managers, and you go, well, what do the property manager do? Oh, they do collections, they handle construction, they handle accounting. You go, whoa, one person has 500 properties and handles all these tasks? That's a bad sign. It's risky for the business, it's risky for the owner, they're not doing your properties uh, justice in what they need to be doing. It is, there's so many moving parts in this business. You all manage your own properties. You understand anything from water bills, electric, evictions, um, construction, maintenance, work orders, leases, renting. Every little piece is moving. One person doing that is insane. You can't do it, you can't build the operation. So it's a bit, what you guys will run into a lot of is when you're vetting property management companies and you've decided to look at that, is most don't have the resources to scale to a level where they can deliver that properly. It's not that they don't want to. A lot of it is they kind of grew from a part-time realtor's perspective. They took on a few properties. They hired a receptionist. They hired some lady because they don't want to deal with it anymore or some man that's going to do their accounting or whatever. They don't really know what they're doing. It is a very strategic approach. So I would recommend that if you are looking at a property management company or deciding that you're going to go down that way, are they consistent? What are their policies? go to their office see what you're dealing with like you know it's like going to somebody's house and deciding hey are you, you know what's what's the old um like the best way to vet a tenant you go to their current house they live in to see how they're going to keep your house right that's that's intense vetting but the same thing you know go to the office see what the operation looks like it's important to know that things are running smoothly you don't want to have those people feeling pressure on the back end to um how do i explain this there's not a lot of money in property management. You're paying less than a cell phone bill a month. Where are they making their money? How are they making a living? You want to make sure, the only way you do that in this game properly is with volume. You need a lot of units, right? Like a cell phone company, they don't, Verizon's not retiring off your cell phone bill. They are off a million cell phone bills or a billion cell phone bills. Same thing with property management, but to get to that scale, it's very few and far between companies that actually get to that scale. So my recommendation is if you want to get into a position where you're going to be 
have a good relationship with your property manager, and they, it can be done, it can certainly be done. It is not frequent that you find the right ones, but when you do, you're in a position where, in the old adage when you get into it, hey, I want a passive investment, there's no such thing as a truly passive investment in real estate. That doesn't, I mean, maybe it exists, not in my world, I don't know. But you're gonna have a very hands-off approach or a much better approach with the right management company. So after you've determined whether you're going to manage your own properties or not, that's the question you've asked. If you've gone that route, I'm sure you can make, you know, you're prepared to handle, you're probably swinging a hammer, that's okay. Maybe you have a handyman, that's okay. You know, you've understood the cost. How much savings? Yeah, there's some savings, certainly. Um, but again, it comes back to the original question. How much, you know, how much room do you have in the deal? How, how much room, is it worth the extra 60, 70 bucks a month? You're gonna pay a little in extra in repairs because you don't have to deal with them? Sure, of course you are. But is it worth the extra 120 bucks a month? Do you have enough room in that deal that you initially bought, in that house that you bought, to say, I'm spending time with my kids this weekend, I am not dealing with whatever comes up, or do you not have the room to do that? So, whichever direction you guys decide to go with, there is no right answer. There's who you are, finding the deal that works for you, and then deciding which direction you're gonna go. Am I consistent? And if I'm, am I consistent? Can I handle that eviction? Can I handle the tough questions that I have to ask about my portfolio? If not, is my property management company the right company for me? Don't choose the wrong property management company. It is just as bad as choosing a tenant that's gonna be evicted tomorrow, if not worse. It can make your life difficult. So choose the right one. Um, so that, that's, kind of, that's kind of my piece on tonight. Who's got some, uh, some questions for me? I could talk for, I could talk everybody's ear off. I'm waiting for these guys to tell me when my time's up. Go ahead. Okay, so I do a multi-family uh, property building. Now, how do, you mentioned this while ago, uh, different departments. Mm. How do you, how do you know basically how? I think the question is, how many departments do you say can I ask that question? How many departments is good? You know, the, the, you got the uh, the management side, you got the maintenance side, you got the so side. you're asking what the departments are. So uh, this, in, this gentleman has uh, multifamily uh, uh, units and he's asking about the department question that I just that I mentioned there. So there's two approaches that you find whether you're an individual. I mean this, this, this works whether you're hiring a company or you're an individual. It's the approach that you have to go down. You're gonna realize the fact that each moving part, there's a few specific moving parts in the, in the management world that are big, that take up big chunks of time. Those departments that are, I don't, I don't, this is only from my experience, are you're gonna have a residential affairs department, which is somebody that's handling, um, tenants are gonna call, they might have a, might be a little late on their rent, what's your policy, they probably handle evictions, they're gonna have basic account the questions that they can answer, maybe take, take rents, usually that, that could be accounting. That's your residential affairs department, it's absolutely needed. Um, second department is construction, that's its own department. So it's, so it's tough, sir, you gotta remember that you're taking on payroll when you're doing this kind of stuff, so you've gotta consider all this. But if I'm doing this, just I'm just doing this with a blank slate. Construction department, which is somebody that's dispatching and running all the work orders that come in, you know, um, comes in, is there a system you wanna have? Does anybody, does anybody here not run out of a software system? Really? Seriously? Yeah, that's okay. That's, I know people that run out of Excel, but it's, it's okay. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's okay. I'd recommend, um, from personal experience, I've, we've seen them all, all the software systems, Appfolio tends to be like, so I always compare, there's two software systems that I compare. Pro, uh, Propertyware is kind of like the Microsoft, if I had to say, it's very robust on the back end, not user friendly on the front end. Man, I hope this, I hope they don't see it. But you know, I have no affiliation with either of them, it is what it is. <laughs> Appfolio though is like, um, is like a Mac. It's user friendly on the front end, and they're very, like if you guys have 20 or less properties, run it out of a software system, you're talking like, $30 or less a month to have everything together. Like, do it. There's no question you should do that. Yeah, if you're not running out of a software system at this point, you are really making a lot of extra legwork. So you have um, your software system, you have your construction department that runs the work orders through the software system. You'll have a leasing department or potentially in your situation, you're gonna be looking at maybe having a, a brokerage that's close to you that you know does a good job with your leasing. You don't really have to bring that in-house that you're doing a ton of leases or something. It's not worth bringing in house. Don't try to save the 200 bucks a month because you're, don't cut your leasing agents either. The, like make sure they get paid because they will do you justice if they're getting there. If they know what you want on the front end, they'll bring you good applications and you're not gonna have to think about it. 
uh, leasing department, accounting department. So ultimately, so the guy that actually had purchased my company, he has, I'll tell a quick story. So I was trying to buy other companies at the time and I emailed this guy and he goes, hey, uh, I'm gonna buy your company. I go, hey, we're not for sale, we're growing, we're acquiring other companies. And he kept emailing me, kept emailing me. He said, take a, take a meeting at such and such diner. And I'm like, all right, whatever. So I thought I was gonna go in and give this guy a piece of my mind to leave me alone. And uh, I walk in and I sit down and really easy going guy and he goes, I go, who are you, man? He goes, I said, you just told me you're gonna pay me $40 million for my company. My company's not worth $40 million, what are you doing? And he was like, no, I'm not gonna pay you $40 million. I was like, okay, then what am I doing here? He goes, Google me, and he says his last name. And uh, his last name's Oller, O-L-L-E-R. Go ahead and Google that last name. So his father is actually, and, and his family, they started this business, property management for HOAs in the country. They are the Wentworth Property Management Group. They bought it, took it public, and sold it. And now they own and manage 40,000 units across the country, and they do multifamily housing, about $2 billion worth of multifamily housing. So we learned a lot from them. That was a very interesting, so he basically said to me, this is me, and I said, well, I can't buy you, clearly. And he goes, uh, Okay, how about I buy you? And I said, that sounds like a great deal. So, so literally we had an hour meeting and he bought our company and that was it. Um, but we got to learn from those resources that you wanna have an accounting department, which is really important because he said to me, he goes, he, and he's very, he's very good at seeing uh, clarity through all the mess because this is a, a, a very messy business, right? He goes, the better, he goes, we're just an accounting department when you back it down to it. The better the accounting is, the, like everything dispatches around accounting. Construction all comes back to accounting. Leasing all comes back to accounting. So I'd say if you're gonna spend your time to do this right, especially if you're accumulating properties, get your accounting right up front. We're just an accounting, we're, we're all in the accounting business. So if you're not good with books, if you're not good with numbers, do yourself a solid and go ahead and get somebody that is. Because that's what he said to me. He goes, we're just an, and I'm like, no we're not, we're, we're this, we're this. He goes, yeah, but it all comes back to accounting. I was like. Oh yeah, I guess it does. And I said, your family has a whole lot more experience than I do in this business, so you're right. Um, so we have the accounting department, uh, residential affairs. We also have, we, where we are, you don't have to do this. There's a lease renewal department that we're constantly dealing with lease renewals back and forth, but you're doing, you know, a thousand, two thousand a year. So uh, you don't really need that up front. Um, that, those, that would pretty much cover what you need. Those four or five areas. Yeah. Now, let me ask one other question that I'll be quiet. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so I do management uh, remote. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of software that I can hook up the management company and see what they do? Is there, a okay, so you do management remotely. Is there, so what do you mean, how much do you want to see that they're doing? Do you want to look at, like log into your portal and see what's going on? Yeah, probably on the weekly, uh, by weekly. So the software systems, what they have, they have a tenant login, tenants can pay online, ACH. Oh, but here's a good tip. How many people know what Pay Near Me is? Pay, pay Near Me? Amazing service. How many, how many people have tenants that pay in cash or money order? How many people don't want that? How many people don't want to have to do that meeting, right? If you, give, you sign up for Pay Near Me, it's free. It's with Appfolio, it's in the system. And you can go to a Dollar General store, a 7-Eleven, anywhere they go. They can literally, you send them a barcode to their email. That barcode is directly linked to their account. They hand the cash to the 7-Eleven, they scan it, goes directly into your account, instantly done. It's a really cool way that if, you know, if you're managing remotely and you have a property, somebody's got to drive an hour and they refuse to, they don't have the internet, they don't, have to, they don't want to mail anything in, you literally just send them the barcode that it generates like from the system, it's very easy, and they just walk in and give them cash and it's instantly in your account. We, and I can testify that it works, like hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, yeah. I think it's like somewhere between like one and three bucks to, for the, for, and the tenant pays it. Dollars, yeah, well, it's extremely cheap. It's, it's like, yeah, it's extremely cheap, extremely cheap. It, like, it's a no-brainer. We have tons of people use it. It's also very good for evictions. So let's say somebody goes, hey, I don't mean to get to you, I got 4,000 bucks, I want to give it to you, I don't want to be evicted. Great, here's your barcode, go down to the 7-Eleven and give it to me right now. It's really, really effective. Pay near me. Um, so managing remotely, you can log in with that folio, is a really good portal. So you have an owner portal and a tenant portal. Tenants see their ledger, owners also have statements, work orders, they can see, everything in there so you can see from like a paper standpoint everything going on in your in your company depending on what the management company you know sets or if you have it yourself you can see everything instantly wherever you want yeah i mean you can't like there's, there's nothing that has like a camera in the house if that's what you're asking but but everything is there yeah oh yeah oh yeah somebody else had a question yes Thank you. 
So from a property management standpoint? Repeat the question. Yeah, repeat that question. Is there a way to take a loss in the event that you spend money on your property or no? If I, if I own a property, say I'm a real estate company, LLC, I buy a property, I own it, um, and I have a property, but I would like to hire a management company not to do it myself. Yeah. Um, can I claim from a tax point of view to be managing that property as participating in material management to the point where if there's a loss on that property, so I'm not an accountant. So my first answer is I don't know, but here's what I'm going to go with. That I believe anybody here know that answer as an accountant before I just start talking and somebody goes, you're wrong. So the question is, can, can she, in the event that she hires a property management company um, and there's losses against the property or whatever it may be, can you act in a participating manner for management to show losses against your income? Yeah, it's material participation. Material participation. I have no idea. All I know is at the end of the year, I send you a 1099, and you can write however your accountant disperses that. My, you know what? I don't know. I really don't know that answer from an accounting standpoint. Does anybody know that? I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I wish I did. My material participation is doing actually like, are you doing the work? Are you participating in the management? Are you? Are you part of the running of the... Yeah, no, I understand what it is. I don't know the answer, though. I don't know, like, where the government would stand on that. Tony? I would think it's like any service. If it hits the P&L, and it flows through at the end of the day, the bottom line is... That would be my gut, what Tony's saying, is that it's an expense, it's a loss, you know, if it is against the property, and then you can write that off, but I don't know the ins and outs of that, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, I would, I would say that, though. If you're documenting that you're paying a property management company, it's going to be hard to claim material participation. Yeah, I'm not. I just. I, yeah, good, good question. Above my pay grade. No idea. I This is a good one. Go ahead. I'm going to change gears a little bit. Okay. My question is you said you would pull rent yourself. Mm hmm. So that's going to come down to your boroughs and your areas. So certain areas, so I'm, I can speak from Philadelphia's perspective. So Philadelphia has a, uh, a rental license. So, you, so if you have three units in a building, you can have three leases. That lease can then have, I think it's like up to five non-related people on lease that can sign to the lease. I cannot have a single family unit with two leases. It doesn't, doesn't work against the rental license. Um, as far as a month to month or a yearly lease or a 10 year lease or whatever, here's the reality of the situation. There's, there's, two, there's two sides to this. I know this very well because we use the best eviction attorney in Philadelphia and he just laid it down. He goes, the reality is from a protection standpoint, the owner has the most protection from, at least in our, in our area, um, from a month to month lease. And here's why, because in the rare, and this is very rare, so there's not really a huge advantage, but from attorney speak, I get it, it makes sense. In, the, in a month to month lease, if somebody doesn't pay, in a yearly lease, if somebody pays their rent, but they're doing like, let's say they're doing drugs in the property, they're doing something clearly, uh, to you it's clearly illegal and you know they're causing problems, it can be really difficult to still terminate their lease in, in the court of law if they're still paying rent. It's hard to get a judge to get on side with that. Not impossible, but it can be a little difficult, it can be trying, you're like, oh no, we're not selling drugs, we're not doing drugs, you're like, yes you are, no you are. You know, you're really causing a lot of problems in my neighborhood, it could be a long drawn out process. When you have a month to month lease, you can, ter you can terminate based on, even if they're paying, you can terminate based on time. So time is not disputable. So that means at the end of each month, your lease is over. So if I go, we're not renewing, I don't care if you're paying your rent, I don't care if you're doubling your rent, you're out. You can terminate based on time, now you're in a month to month lease. The downside to a month to month lease is that it becomes a little bit transient in like the people that you might have in there. Some, I can tell you that over time, if your tenant wants to stay and you want them to stay and they're paying, they will stay month to month or 10 year lease, ne like never renewed, renewed, whatever. They're in that property. Um, it definitely helps to have, do you want to, it's like keeping records. You want to have an updated lease. You always want to be renewing your lease. That's good for you. That's good business. But at the end of the day, when it comes, you're deciding between a piece of paper that's going to stand in court or not. So your choice is then, do you want, you know, sometimes a tenant will feel more secure. You know, I, I get it. Like I wouldn't sign like a, a one month to one month lease personally because if I have a family and I want my family to live there, I don't want to feel like, hey, every month somebody's going to maybe terminate my lease. So I have more sense of like a longevity having a one year lease. 
all, all the leases that we've dealt with, it's I think like one or two have ever come up where you've had a, t a paying tenant that we were like, they gotta go. And then we had to deal with it in that capacity. So the month to month from attorney speak, yeah, you're more protected. Don't, if the tenant wants to stay and you want them to stay, they stay. If not, you know, they go. So I wouldn't worry about um, get over uh, wrapped in that. My time's up. Yeah. Oh, Jay has a question. Jay, ask me a question. What's your thought process on judgments or collecting, you know, collecting that fee for somebody that you could file eviction or behind rent? Oh, good question. Do you guys go through the procedure? Do you personally go through the procedure? Or do you just say, you know what, it's like you're all going to go through the procedure? So I've had multiple uh, experiences in this. So you get, let's say you evict somebody, you get a judgment against them for three thousand dollars in back rent. Go ahead. Oh. You want to let me know? Go ahead. Oh, you got something. Okay. So in the event that you go to the court, you get a judgment. They owe you three thousand dollars in rent. Here's the mentality I always say: go into the eviction with. Treat it as dead money. Okay. Write it off in your head. You're, paying, you're trying to collect money from somebody. Now I'm looking at the guy who does collections and he's thinking like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm gonna go with my experience. Treat it as dead money in your head. Now, I've had an owner, a couple owners that like, over time they hired an attorney that would then split the collection fees. You have to have certain documentation, certain things in order, and you can actually freeze bank accounts. It's a lot of work at times to do that, but at one point this guy had an extra $3,000 a month from all his evictions coming in from back dead money. But it was still dead money. It was money he didn't know. So mentally prepare yourself for the fact that, hey, I'm not going in they're gonna write me a check for three grand because they owe me three grand. That's not happening. I mean, one out of 100 leases, does that happen? If you got it, great. Assume the money's gone. Then there's different services. I mean, at Folio, I'll go back to it. They actually just opened up, and they're a publicly traded company. I didn't realize how big they are, but they have a service that actually goes and does debt collection. If they collect the debt, you just turn the file over, they collect the debt, they'll split, they, they take a percentage of the fees, and then you get the rest of the money. In my opinion, that's the deal you take. You take the deal where you hand the file off to this gentleman right here, take all your files, um, once upon a time, and then you know let them handle it, because that's what they do. That's their specialty, that's their business. Don't. Definitely don't become a debt collector yourself. You'll drive yourself nuts. You can't do any offensive business and go acquire properties if you're trying to collect bad debt. So mentally walk in with it broken, saying, I'm not gonna get this money, turn it over, turn the file over if you so choose, and then the collection company, that's how they get paid, and they're good at it. So, do you have a question? Yeah, what is your experience with veteran-based Not much, I don't really have much. Um, so there's a lot of different programs that approach us, like you know, if the city gets $3 million in funding, $5 million bucks in funding, Here's what I've learned aside from like Section 8, which Section 8 is big, right? This, typically the smaller city ones, I don't know about everyone, most of the small ones run out of money eventually. So you've really got to find out how much money they have. Oh, you just got five million bucks, great, but does that five million bucks cover all of Baltimore? Because that's like $100 a house or $10 a house, right? So a lot of them run out of money, they're not as polished, they're startup funds, so it's not as smooth of an operation. So the only one that I've really, you know, we do a lot of business with a ton is Section 8 because it's just a government, you know, they're so established. Um, they have their own nuances though. You, you know, the, the, the subsidized housing has, is their own beast. That's just totally a cash tenant versus that. So we've broken it down into simple math with Section 8 versus a cash, ten, a cash tenant. And a cash tenant, I mean somebody that pays you directly all the money. Is, um, it's a four to one manpower difference. So for every one property I'd have cash, that one to one, I'd have to hire four people to deal with the situations that come up with Section 8. Now it doesn't mean it's bad, it's not guaranteed money. It's a guaranteed source of money, but it's not guaranteed money. There's things that come up, you have inspections, you know, hey, the inspector comes out, no good, boom, you gotta be out there in 72 hours, and you gotta follow their guidelines. They are a good organization. They are good for what they do. You've just gotta know how to play within that game and be prepared. Um, but I do, you know, I do, I'm an advocate. We manage a lot of that prop, those properties. And um, if you know how to stay within their guidelines, um, you know, it, it can work for sure. Yes? Uh, fees. Uh, fees, you're gonna see property management fees anywhere from five to 12%. Um, my honest answer is don't even ask the question when you walk in the door to the management companies. Find out if you wanna work with the management company because thousand dollar rental you're talking there's between 50 and 100 bucks a month the right property management company trust me you would pay 200 bucks a month 20 percent if it's the right management company the wrong management company you for free it doesn't matter you just you're losing money so five to ten percent is pretty pretty common anywhere in the country 
Um, don't get wrapped up on that though. Make sure you have the right management company first before you, yeah. So you started from uh, buying the properties and that, right? And wholesaling actually. Like wholesaling and then eventually mm -hmm. you come to the right but what, what point you come to the uh, uh, need that you need uh, management? So my management company came out of, from wholesaling, came out of, it, it, so it wasn't, it wasn't like that for me. Um, we started the management company as, as a subsidiary to the wholesaling because people were coming back saying, hey, you want to manage my property? And we're like, not really. And then we were sort of like, all right, let's take some on. And then I was like, hey, we can figure this thing out. So that's how it came about for us. Where do I see most clients, though, find the need? About 10 properties. When you get to about 10, you start to get into a position where, especially if you have a job, like during the day, you get into, you're starting to run a business at that point. You go from an investive, investing perspective to a business, and then you're like scaling from 10 to 20. Once you get, so you're actually in this business, sorry if this freaks everybody out, you're actually most fragile, I find, from three to 10 properties. Fragile in cash flow that can support your operation. When you get up around 20, if you've bought about 20 properties free and clear, you have a business that now will support itself, not free and clear, I'm sorry, definitely free and clear, you're in good shape. At the 50% rule that I spoke about earlier, you're usually in a very good position financially um, where that business, you don't have to kick money into that business in the event that somebody turns over. So three to 10, you're actually most fragile. In my opinion, you'll probably end up putting money out of your pocket from your day job. When you get to 20, if you bought right, the key signal to you will be, hey, is this thing, so do I have to write checks back into this or not? If you don't, you bought right, and you're managing right. Any other questions? Yes? How about increases in the rent? Put that in the lease yeah, we do. We do 4% as standard increase. Um, here's what I find that you know, you initially depends on the area. Some areas are hotter than others. Some areas are, you know, you might have a property that somebody hasn't raised the rent in 10 years. They come to you for management and they're like, hey, it's 600 bucks. You're like, this is a $1,200 rental. It makes sense to raise the rent. Um, I don't ever recommend if you're if you're negotiating between like 30 or 40 bucks with a, a, a really established, well-paying tenant that wants to live there, takes care of your house. Do not risk your cash flow for 30 or 40 bucks a month. You know, put it in the lease, apply it. If there's some pushback, don't rock the boat. There's no sense. I mean, they leave, right? Somebody leaves a house. It's not one month's rent, and all of a sudden somebody's back in there. It's probably three months. Let's assume there's no eviction. That's a whole different story. Let's assume somebody leaves. Probably two to three months worth of rent. Probably a five to ten thousand dollar renovation turnover. Plus, you're paying a leasing agent. You know. If that 30 or 40 bucks a month was worth the 10 or 15 grand you just outlaid for that property, probably doesn't offset itself. Um, so it's you really gotta play those case by case, and that's why we have an entire lease renewal department. Um, we determine if something's severely undervalued. You know, but the other end of it is, hey, if this property is worth 600 bucks, you know, and it, or I'm sorry, it's worth 1200 and they're paying 600, yeah, you're losing 600 bucks a month. Um, you gotta rent, increase that rent quickly or you know, be willing to say, hey, I'm, I'm cool with the vacancy at this point because that's a lot of money a month I'm giving up. So you gotta kind of make a judgment call on that. But in your leases, do you have it? 4%, 4% yes. Every year the rent's going up. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we go shopping for management companies, mm -hmm. uh, what are the major factors we need to keep in mind? Uh, what Honestly, the, the truthful answer is just go go to their offices, and, it's in, and within three to five, um, there's actually a local investor down here. He's a really good investor. Uh, invest nationally, um, and one of his big thing he before he goes into a market, uh, Dan, he's probably watching this. He probably knows. He's smart, he goes in and he interviews the management companies, he goes to their offices, he goes to see their operations, he gets to know them. If you do three to five um, physical visits or spend the time up front on those management companies, you, wouldn't have, you won't ask me that question, you'll know. When the right company's in front of you, you're gonna be like, this is clearly what I need for my property versus what you don't want, Somebody who manages 500 properties, there's three people in the office, papers everywhere, it's in a dingy basement, been there, I've been there throughout my growth process, that was me once, I get it. So I grew out of that and understood what people needed. So you'll see a clear separation, literally just walking in the office, dealing with the company, like you'll know quickly. So there's no hard answer until you go. Any other, yeah? For the annual percent rental increase, mm. 
So it's in every lease. When, so when, typically when a lease either renews, uh, one of two things happens. It either renews automatically on a yearly basis or it reverts. If you don't have a, a renewal automatically in our town goes month to month. So my question is for like ease of That's the smart way to do it if you have enough properties. I mean, we have 2,000 units all on different time frames, so we have signals and triggers set up in our system. If you can make your life more simple by doing everybody at the same time, it's gonna make your life a whole lot easier for sure. I'd also recommend, if you guys, as you guys get at Folio, do everything, get zip forms, use zip forms, um, e-signatures. We have no papers in our office, none. Every lease is click signed um, for what we do, and it's so much better. Um, it's emailed, comes back, signature, it's valid in court, 100% valid in court. But to answer your question, if you can, if you have the ability to, yeah, set it up absolutely all the same month. It'll be way easier on your, your own legwork. You flagging me, Jay? Let's do one more. One more? Go ahead, sir. Okay, so talking about property management companies, I dare certain properties that they would accept and certain properties that they would not accept to manage. I don't understand your question. Say it again. So are there, are there certain properties that property management companies do not accept to manage? Oh, oh, oh. Um, they should. They should. And actually, I can actually, so the question is, are there, pro are there properties that certain management companies won't? Sure. There's certain companies that, different reasons will limit them. Ge geography, somebody might be only in Baltimore. That's all they do in Baltimore. So they're not going to take your property outside of Baltimore. You might be in an area that's too rough in Baltimore that people just say, I'm not dealing with it. What I have found from, from uh, dealing with so many owners is that it's actually not the properties most of the time. Now, honestly, we, ha I, we have literally, in Philadelphia, we have s probably some of the most dangerous blocks literally in the country. I mean, we've had, I have stories, people getting killed. I have stories, I'm up here in like nice clothing and stuff, but I deal with some really tough stories on a daily basis, and it's, it's tough. We also rent to some of the Philadelphia Eagles, some of the 76ers, it's everything in between. Some of the most high-end execs and you know, Liberty One, all that kind of stuff. We deal with some of those high-end millions. You're thinking, well, that's a huge range of properties you deal with. The owners are the most important relationship with the management company in regards to that question that you have. So the process is all the same. The pr if your processes are consistent, whether you are on the worst block in the country or the nicest building in Philadelphia, our processes are consistent right across the board. And what you find is that there's actually not a whole lot of discrepancy between evictions and, and stuff like that. Different kinds of problems. One place has a shooting, the other place has a $100,000 attorney jamming you up in court. Two different worlds, but the problems are fairly similar. The question is the owner you're, 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 you're fitting in with. So from a management perspective, it's really important to understand the owner that you're gonna deal with. If an owner's expectations are not gonna align with the management companies, it's not a good fit for either party. So I don't wanna say we would decline, but we'd probably just say, this ends badly no matter where your properties are. That's what a property management company said. Most, what they'll do is they're just trying to accumulate units, so we'll just take them all. It's not the right way to do it. All right, so I'm gonna take a break. I'm gonna hand this to Jay. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, we're gonna take a quick break, and then I ask you uh, Thanks, investors locally to come up talk about either a tip, trick, horror story, success story. Uh, Good. Hopefully you'll get some good knowledge from them. So we'll do five minute break and Mark Owens is gonna come up and then who else we got? Terry Royce, Jimmy Harris. Nothing too, nothing too bad, right? Nothing too bad, right? Let's grab my jacket. Oh, sorry, Mark. Thanks. This is somebody's jacket though. Thanks. 